thank you for coming and pulling this hall and this event with just so much love. You can, I feel it coming in front of you. We have several people um, who are going to be sharing some thoughts and memories and um, inspiration. <laughs> and I just found out I have to go after Peter and I'm having a lot of nerves about it. <laughs> um, so we're going to spend about uh, a, little, a little bit of time, about an hour, um, sharing some memories. And uh, then we're going to clear the chairs up uh, off the floor and we're going to have some dancing. So I hope that everyone will stay for as much of that as you are able to. Um, I'm Katie German. I'm the executive director of the Country Dance and Song Society. And that's what we're Award today, um, and I will talk more about the award later. Um, but these are some of the most special people that I've uh, met in my life, and I, I, um, I mean, I'm pretty complimentary, but I really mean it this time. <laughs> um, no, seriously, so much of what I have been able, to, so much of the way that I've been able to engage with um, intergenerational communities is because of the work that these four have done. And I think a lot of us see a lot of heads nodding, a lot of us feel that way. So this is an incredible day, and I'm so glad to be here. We're going to hear from each of them and a few other friends. And to start us off today, Mary Kay, where are you? There she is! <laughs> about what we wanted to express uh, in, to you all. Um, we thought it would be interesting um, to share our origin stories, how we started dancing, because interestingly enough, we all started dancing, had really positive dance experiences very young, which I think in our generation wasn't so common. And, um, but we all did, and I'm just gonna share a couple of my early wonderful dance experiences. Um, I grew up in, as a lot of you know, in a small town in Minnesota, White Bear Lake, and um, my next door neighbors were Croatian, and they had three daughters my age, and they belonged to a folk dance group, and they invited me to be in their Croatian folk dance group. I don't have an ounce of Croatian blood, but I loved it. Every Saturday morning, all these little Croatian American girls and me <laughs> danced, and we had costumes, and we went danced in the state fair and the, um, the festival of nations, and all these wonderful events. It was heavenly, and so that was my start at dancing, and it kept going that strain of dancing for a long time, and. Um, but then, when I was in eighth grade, I had uh, a teacher named, in my Catholic school, Sister Mary Martin. <laughs> so, Sister Mary Martin, it turns out, before she was a sister, she played backup piano in a polka band. <laughs> <laughs> and it was called Whoopi John's Polka Band. And it was, really famous in Minnesota. They played all through the, um, all in rural places and also in the Twin Cities. They, they had gigs pretty much every night of the year. And there were nine men and one woman in that band. The woman was the piano player. And she became Sister Mary Martin eventually. And so when I was in eighth grade, Sister Mary Martin, decided to have a party for the eighth grade girls. Only the girls. We didn't know what was what this was about at all. And we met in the gymnasium and had all these snacks and then all of a sudden she goes over and she pulls over this big um, upright piano. And she pulls it out in the middle of the floor and she lines all of us girls up facing each other and proceeds to teach us the Virginia <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> we could not believe it. We were, every time she stopped, we'd say, no, more, more, you have to do more. And we went on and on for quite a while with the 
Virginia. So that was that was my introduction, and um, and it was quite wonderful. So I'm just going to jump ahead. Those were my two, you know, um, early entries into dance, which were wonderful, but all of them. And I'm just going to fast forward through all kinds of stuff and. <laughs> and come to 1984 when I moved to Vermont. And I didn't really have a job. I'd been teaching ESL in New York City and, and I met Amnons and there was a job open in our county and Peter said, you should be a music teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, you know, the interesting thing about all of us is none of us majored in music education. And, um, and I had majored in music, but not any education. And I thought, oh, I don't really know how to do it. And Peter said, come and watch me. And go watch some other people. And so I spent a day shadowing Peter. And at the end of the day, I thought, oh, singing and dancing. I can do that. <laughs> and that was fun, actually. And, um, and then I went and I shadowed Casey. Where are you, Casey? Yes. Do you remember that? I do remember that. That was a long time ago. And I spent a day with Casey in her classroom, and I took away so many gems from every classroom I visited. The third classroom I visited was in Philadelphia with John Crump, who many of you know. Yeah, so I just, that was my music education, one over the one. Done, <laughs> done. And I jumped into the music teaching job from Hal, six job, six schools in four days. Did that job for two years, and then I passed it on to Andy. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy actually kept one of those schools for about 30 years, didn't you, Andy? Where are you? 32. But so about that time, all four of us were teaching in Southern Vermont in uh, various, we had almost all the schools covered. <laughs> We started getting together um, and sharing the songs that we were excited and dances we were excited about and that worked in the classroom. And we got together every couple of weeks, and it was our little music mafia. And it really, out of those meetings and those that sharing, is what New England dancing masters grew out of those meetings. It was very organic. And um, we realized that there was a kind of a hole in, there, were, there weren't good materials for music teachers with good recordings. And we decided that it was something we could, we could do. And we conceived of the project um, Chimes of Dunkirk. It went well, it was successful. And then we just kept doing more and more projects because people seem to respond really well to it. So, and I just want to say um, thank you to all my New England Dancing Masters pals for all these years of sharing and support. It was quite a support system, and I always try to encourage young music teachers to find that. Find a support system of other teachers that you can share and, and excite with, with it really helps to be excited about what you're teaching. And when you teach it to your friends and they get excited, it really gives you that energy to go into the classroom and, and do it. And, um, and I also just want to um, express my gratitude to all the teachers and community dance people who've used our materials over the years and support us and, and also to CDSS. Um, yeah. Thanks, and I'm going to pass it on to Andy now. We tried to write our remarks down because we're all talkers. <laughs> Storytellers, dance callers. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, CBS. Thank you, Katie. I remember you from Timber Ridge. That was a long time ago, weren't we? Not, no, no, Buffalo Gap. Now I'm really dating myself. Back three generations of family camps in West Virginia. But anyway. 
Oh, look at that. Thank you. Thank you, C. C has the Buffalo Gap t-shirt. Anyway, thank you, Mary. Can I just amplify? This wouldn't have been possible without our quartet of, of, uh, of support. That's so, so key. Um, and thank you to all of you colleagues and friends. I, I said, am I going to say thank you to colleagues or thank you to friends? And I ended up writing colleagues dash friends. Because in this business, your colleagues really are your friends. And there are many of your closest friends. Because you're not just teaching a subject, you're teaching a whole part of the human spirit. My first contact with traditional dance was in the fourth grade in Thomas Jefferson Elementary School in Falls Church, Virginia. And um, we did square dancing as a little unit in PE. I still remember my assigned partner's name. I hope Carol and Gail, is she here today? <laughs> uh, there was quite a lot of politics on the playground about who got assigned who and what that meant. <laughs> We learned with our kids to sort of say a partner is just a temporary thing, and when you say thank you, you may walk away from them. <laughs> so we've been teaching short-term relationships for a long time. <laughs> um, I've diverged from my program already. <laughs> uh, in my high school years, I did make it with the banjo, and, but I was really a Baroque music nerd, and I tried one year of conservatory out in Wisconsin. And I was miserable. And I went back to D.C. and picked up the banjo and started playing with folks at the uh, Washington Folklore Society. Anyone here? I know Alan and Debbie are part of that. And we would go to these sessions downtown and play Old Joe Clark for literally 15, 20 minutes. And then just stop and look at each other like we've just seen God. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, how long has this been going on? This is not what we do at the conservatory. <laughs> So, um, in 1976, so I'm going to plow ahead to 1976, um, I moved to Vermont on a very crazy adventure to build banjos and live in the country. My mother was right, it was a stupid adventure, and we knew nothing about it, but it was the best thing I ever did. <laughs> so, um, my first contra dance in New England was at Palmer's Dance Barn up in Unity, New Hampshire. That's also where Hillary Clinton and Obama made, made, made up, so that Obama would march all the way to the White House in unity in New Hampshire. Um, Chris Madigan, I don't think Chris is here, I didn't see him. Chris, thank you. Chris was calling, and his wife at the time, Lark Madigan, was, uh, she was not Lark Madigan at that point, they, she was playing fiddle, and there was a concertina player who was also a Morris dancer, and there was an old upright piano with an empty piano bench. And I sat down and played, and I went home with seven dollars and a new career. <laughs> um, I haven't made much more than that. Actually, I have. <laughs> as a unionized member of the education career, I, I do I do well. Um, anyway, in the mid '80s, I was working at Farm and Wilderness Camp, and who did I run into but Henry Chapin? Henry's here. Great to see you, Henry. And we make a good pair. Henry was calling the dances. I had not done any calling. And I was running the so-called string band, the famous F&W string band. It was made up of teenagers who had very little experience with jigs and reels. And I remember uh, one of my really favorite guys there in my cabin. He was a heavy metal music fan. But um, he learned to play backup piano. And he was, our, he was our, the rock of our band as we toured around central Vermont and playing in gazebos on town squares and, you know, calling dances. And, and that really was the beginning of my music education career, was teaching backup piano to that heavy metal fan from Greenwich Village. Um, within a few days, within, within a few, not days, within a few years, I was keep working five days a week in the Wyndham County Public Schools. And it was just a few years after that, those two summers at F and W. And I think I started out subbing for you, Peter, a couple of times up in Wynn Hall, and I remember <laughs> subbing for Mary Kay at Townsend School. And um, anyway, it's a similar story, Mary Kay. I, this is a doable job. I can do this. And I did take over Dover, where I taught for 32 years. Um, one spring day in 1991, I stopped by Peter's house. I remember this clear as a bell. I was coming home from school. I just resigned from uh, one of my teaching jobs, knocked over, um, where things were not going well with the admin there. 
And I said to, I was feeling a bit tossed about my life. What am I going to do? And I explained the situation, and Peter looked at me and without hesitation said, that's great. I have an idea for a project. <laughs> okay. um, and that's really, in my mind, how New England Dancing Masters, sometimes called Needham, um, began. We had no name for the project. We had no business plan. Never have. <laughs> That's on the to-do list. Okay. Uh, we had no capital, um, just an idea and motivation. Mary Kay, Peter, and Mary Alice and I were all teaching, and we were all using traditional dance in our classes, and some Amazons were starting to do residencies. We were making song and dance handouts using a combination of typewriters and mineograph machines. Remember the purple fingers? You know, teacher people? Purple fingers. And uh, what we wanted to do was uh, create a single book with all of our favorite dances, those that work beautifully in schools, with a variety of ages, dances that could be used at family dances. And importantly, we wanted the directions for the dances to be easily understood. And this is one of the most common compliments we get uh, via email and such, is how clear the directions are. And we wanted the books to um, motivate teachers to keep dancing as part of their school community, not a little once a year unit, but a part of the school year of doing dancing regularly in either the classroom or in the music classroom. Um, I have a very strong memory, very positive, sitting with you, Peter, at the computer and working out language together. You and I would toss it back and forth until bingo, one of us came up with the right phrase, striving for clarity and consistency and encouraging the reader, whoever that might be, to develop their own voice as a dance teacher. I have a distinct memory of making a decision not to put in the calls, not to say, these are the calls for this dance. Um, we did that for the singing squares, but nothing else. Instead, we used the second person voice in the descriptions. For example, A1, face your partner, do si do, promenade. And that language was the language the teacher would use to do the walkthrough, and then very naturally, the dance calls follow from clear, unambiguous language of a walkthrough. And I think it kind of worked, it worked for me. Uh, Mary Kay uh, drafted the chapter, Building a Dance Community in the Classroom. I really remember that draft, and it's been in all the books ever since. And that was central to our approach, making uh, dance have a deep and lasting effect on the school community, as a whole. Uh, shortly thereafter, Peter and Mary Alice wrote uh, our first collection of American singing games. That's a whole afternoon of discussion groups in itself. Uh, say no more, say no more. Um, and Mary Alice was drawn into the partnership, I believe, at that point, and we really became uh, the quartet. Our recordings were made to create the feeling of being at an actual dance, not highly arranged, not metronomically accurate in some cases. Some of them speed up, if you notice. Um, like a regular dance, okay? Um, not highly arranged, spontaneous, energetic, and joyful. Many of our good friends appear on these recordings. Anyone here appear on a Needham recording? I met a few of you, yes, Stephen, you know, and I can, yes, Mary, thank you. You were on the originals, yeah. Um, Mary Lee. Um, I should mention that Fred Bruni, who's here today, was our first printer. <laughs> as, as well as a, as a great inspiration. But my, my best memory of Fred is I brought up the, the proof for the Times of Dunkirk. And Fred kind of put his glasses down a little bit and started turning. Who said it has two S's? <laughs> and I knew we had chosen the correct printout. <laughs> assign dances to any particular age or, or grade level. Uh, the dances were all traditional dances. Uh, the sequence of instruction was completely flexible. The same dance can be enjoyed by a middle, bunch of middle school students or a first grade class. It's all context, how it's, how it's presented um, by the teacher. Or even the same dance gets set away. Okay, they're all just authentic dances chosen for their uh, value. Early along the way, I focused my career on public schools, and I basically, as Mary Kay mentioned, I had to 
basically a couple of 30 plus year school residencies where I started off teaching one group of children and eventually started teaching their children, which is always a good experience. My dad had you in music class. <laughs> um, Needham has published, uh, at this point, eight books, 10 music uh, albums, three video recordings. They're all now available as MP3s and downloads, video streams. We've tried to keep up. I think of Needham as more of a service than a business. We pay our bills and we pay each other on a regular basis, but more importantly, we ship out these materials all over the country and even overseas. Boy, have you ever tried to ship to the, uh, to the, uh, the economic, uh, the European Union? Ooh, 10 pounds of paperwork. Okay, um, over the ages, oh, I wanted to just say, I'm the one who ships the books, and I sometimes wonder when I send out all those books, you know, what's happening at the other end of that shipment? And it can be many different things, not all perhaps perfect. Over the ages, music educators have played an important role in sustaining traditional customs and folk traditions in their communities. All of these dances in schools, summer camps, weddings, family reunions, old home days, and community gatherings, the kind of customers that we have, people calling those kinds of dances, um, they play an essential role in the ever-flowing American traditional dance scene as much as any contra dance series with the touring band and season of different callers. They're really part of our tradition. And I'm proud to say, in my closing mark, remark here, I'm very proud to say that the work that Peter and Mary Alice and Mary Kay and I have done has been to serve this grassroots aspect of community dance. The children, the family reunions, the weddings, the summer camps, the old home days, and school after school after school. And I like to imagine that there are kids across the country continuing to ask the question that we heard so many times over the years in classrooms. Are we going to dance today? <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs>
was that? <laughs> now, I mean, this is maybe 20 years ago, and it was that moment where, like, in, you know, we have all had that moment where a portal in your life all of a sudden opens. And that, it, like, it was so, like, it opened, and I was like, what was that? And she said, oh, it's, it's me, we have the book. And so she gives me the book, and I literally, like, stepped through the portal, and it was, like, never the same for me as a teacher. And, like, every single day for, you know, 20 years onward, I used something from the Needham books, and it was just transformative in my life. And it's funny you said magical. Thank you, Andy. I don't. That's that's um, that's how I feel. Like, but actually, not like magic. Like, did you get? Did you see the trick? Do you know how it was done? It was like actual magic. Like, it's totally. And, and I, I mean, I, the, the the thousands of times I've gotten to use the the, the materials, and then uh, 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 with so many different families and children and young children, and to adapt them to to do you know Sasha with like two year olds, and to do and to, to just to like to it's been a, a magical ride, and then to get to and to meet you all and to meet to you know sometimes people say like don't meet your heroes, you know you'll be disappointed. I was like. I got to meet my heroes. It was like, these are the, uh, of course, they're exactly as I hoped they would be. And uh, what an honor it was to, to connect. And uh, so uh, just total gratitude today. So I want to sing something with you all. I'll teach it to you, and then uh, and I'll play it. Let's see. I'm lucky there's a sun. I'm lucky there are stars. I'm lucky there's a moon and a sky. And when I go to bed, lay down my sleepy head, I'm lucky there's you and I. I'm glad the rains fall, the winds blow, the oceans roll and roll. I'm glad the flowers bloom, the birds sing, as the earth spins round and round. Sing with me. I'm lucky there's a sun, I'm lucky there are stars, I'm lucky there's a moon and the sky. And when I go to bed, lay down my sleepy head, I'm lucky there's you and I. I'm glad the children play in their own way, and people love and grow. I'm glad the mountains rise.
One was the night I went to Pinewood Folk Music Week for the very first time, really not knowing anything about what it was. I just went because Peter was going and I had just danced with him and fallen in love and followed him everywhere he went. <laughs> <laughs> so I go there and I have dinner and I don't really know anybody and I go into the main camp house and there's Steve Mitchie starting the evening with Wild Mountain Time and the whole room broke out in like eight part harmony. No one had a piece of paper in their hands. They just sang and I thought, where are they? <laughs> and at that dance where I met Peter, after the dance there was a posting next door and I'm like, people are just singing for fun. I get to be part of this and wow, this is great, where am I? So I now that I'm an old lady, I'm in a hiking group with some lovely women who I must proudly say are 81, 81, 78, and me, I'm 71. And man, we hike and paddle, but last week, we were driving right by the Dublin Town Hall in southwestern New Hampshire. And I remember the night in 1974 when my dear friend Jane Miller, who is here today, who I was interning with in her first grade class because I was a master's um, student getting my elementary ed degree at UNH. And she had said, hey, you want to come to a weekend of country dancing? Because I said, well, where's the international folk dancing? I just loved that and called it. Well, we don't have that, but you could come with us. So I went with them, not knowing. And that night, Jack Perrin was calling the dance, and Robin and Randy Miller were playing the music. And it was a summer night, and Jane showed me quickly how to bust step swing so I would know what to do. And the night before, we had also gone, Andy, to Palmer's Barn in Unity, New Hampshire. And that first balance and swing just took me like flying off into space. I remember that, and turning under and giving weight. I just, it was like, wow, I have arrived. This is it for my life. I'm just soaring now. And a college at Earlham, a Richmond, Indiana college, uh, with a cooker school, I went folk dancing, international dancing, which I lived for on Friday nights. And Jack Bailey, who uh, the son, uh, Jay Bailey, who's at Fairlands Farm here in Brattleboro, uh, was a professor and called square dances there. But I had never experienced country dancing. And so that was a big turning point. And after that, we went to with the Millers, uh, Nelson, Peterborough. We danced with Duke Miller. And uh, we did later on Dudley Lofton and Fred Gurney later on in Putney. <laughs> and see that John Anderson right here in this room when it camps. And um, Brad Foster, of course. <laughs> and it was just the beginning of a, and Todd Whittemore, yeah, the beginning of a long, long life that brings me here right now. And uh, because of my passion for dance that following year after I had gone with Jane, I then went to the Cambridge Y to a Ted Snell dance. That's the first one with folks singing. And Peter walked in the door in front of me and I asked him to dance, and we danced every single dance that night. Which is <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the dance, he had to go off to work, and I said, well, tomorrow night, it's more dancing, are you coming? We went to Morris dancing in that week. Night we went to the Orchard Wells and had, had a drink, and um, the waitress put a red rose on our table. Nobody else had a red rose. <laughs> <laughs> that was meant to be. And so that weekend coming up was the Folk Song Society Getaway Weekend at Greater Boston. I had no idea what that was, but I called and signed up and registered. <laughs> and when I got there, before Peter, I was at a sing around with Tony Salatan, and uh, I said to the guy next to me, uh, what are we going to do all weekend? And he said, singing and dancing. I went, great! <laughs> and that was the first weekend where I sang a shape note song for the first time. Went to a round singing workshop children's play party games with the mother of Stuart Kenny, Maureen Kennedy, and the gospel thing, which just blew my mind, and the comedy dance at night, and got a ride home with Peter. We sang all the way home, and that was the beginning of why, again, why I'm here today. And I would just go on to attend and teach at CSS camps for all these 30 years of went there for a honeymoon to American Week. And that was 45 years ago this summer. And this past summer, I went again with Jane Miller being there and many other families of three generations who had grown up coming as campers and as parents and grandparents with their kids. Um, back in Cambridge, because I was very 
antsy kid who had a hard time sitting still in elementary school. I think part of my purpose in life when I discovered how much I loved music with young children was dancing and moving and bringing joy to schools, which for me weren't always joyful places. And so I landed a job in a daycare center in a high rise in Cambridge um, and took classes at the same time with people like Jackie <coughs> Spector, Doug Lippman on making music, folk music with children. And I would, and I got a dulcimer, and I learned from Lorraine Lee at the Cambridge Adult Center, and I'd go in and with these kids, you know, three-year-olds, two-year-olds, I would say, hey, you know this one? Sally, go around in the sun. Sally, go around in the moon. And they'd say, oh, you know that. They were all black, and they said, Sally, go around in the sun. Sally, go around in the moon. Sally, go around in the sun. All of them afternoon. <laughs> so, <laughs> I learned a lot from them. And then I went on to become a music teacher and was invited to join um, and doing school assembly programs with Peter of Songs and Storytelling all over the East Coast, teacher workshops all over the country. But when I got offered a music teaching job, I was a little insecure. And so Mary Kay and Andy and Peter and I, who all had passions for storytelling, harmony singing, folk music, contradancing, and decided, okay, we're going to be music teachers now, and shared all of our passions. That was truly significant and exciting for um, I want to tell you that after teaching music for part-time for seven years, I decided to go freelance and do school residencies. And because Peter was doing that, he was having way too much fun. I, I started to, I got a phone call one day from Mike Kessler, who happens to be here all the way from the Hudson Valley and said, I'm the principal of this school, of Grange Elementary. Would you like to come and work with our first grade or kindergarten for five days? We can have you for five days for just kindergarten. Great. So I went there, and I taught the kindergartners. And one of the kindergartners went home and taught his grandmother, hey, Josh, say one, two, three. And she happened to be the principal of another school. <laughs> schools for about 25 years. I went down there to teach K-3, to which was my you know, favorite thing. So I want to thank Mike and Julie who are here today. And I think that's all I want to say. I'm so grateful to CBSS for providing the resources, bringing together the musicians and dancers at dances and music camps to foster community dancing, which changed my life in deep and such meaningful ways. And so much stuff. When we do residencies together, when we do teacher workshops together, I'm you know I'm, I'm teaching dancing and stuff, and I'm, I'm I'm good at that. I don't know how to do that, but they you know and then Mary Alice says she provides the joy. She's my joy supply in those things, like along along with really great teaching. But I'm not here to talk about her. I'm talking about here about uh, Will Doublestein. So uh, we were, we noticed a few years ago that all of these uh, YouTubes are coming up with uh, of these kids doing dances. There's an, a few teachers that put up uh, YouTubes of kids doing dances from doing dancing masters, and it was lovely and it's great. But all of a sudden, these ones come up with these kids doing dancing and we're dancing so beautifully and so passionately. And, and I looked it up, and it's like bow tie music, Will Double. I don't know what is Will Double saying. What is this? It's, Guy must have grown up in a dance community. He must be a third generation dance guy or something like that. And so um, we actually, uh, I got in touch with him. He has an amazing website and he, and he has a lot of YouTubes and so a bunches and hundreds, thousands of teachers are learning not just uh, dances from our collections but also uh, really wonderful creative movement exercises and, and, and uh, you know, uh, or xylophone arrangements. And, but all taught so, so excitedly. So we um, we actually got in touch with Will, and he sort of works with us now, actually, because it's just because none of us are doing residencies anymore. And he's been he's sort of done. Will has started doing some workshops with teachers, and he's going to be at the uh, leading dancing at the National uh, American Orc Shoulder Association coming up in November, and um, he's just and he didn't. And what I found out was he did not grow up in three generations or two generations or even one generation. He really. He just figured it out on his own, and also from some of the work workshops he took, which I think is pretty extraordinary. So, well done, Steve.
Here's Mary Alice, Mary Kay, and Andy. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, I could really relate to what you were saying when you said, like, where am I? Because I'm feeling that this weekend. <laughs> where am I? Because this, 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 is, this doesn't really happen where I live in Indianapolis. And, um, but it has been a joy getting to know so many uh, people that are here, and everybody has been so welcoming to me. And I definitely green at all this stuff. What I've learned has all been through the books. So I mean, you know, I do my best, but there's definitely things just from last night that I learned, and there's, there's, there, I have a long ways to go. But it has been fun um, bringing these great resources to other other music teachers. Um, so I'm a kindergarten and fourth grade music teacher at an elementary school called Boone Meadow. It's in, uh, it's near Indianapolis. And um, I started teaching 12 years ago. Uh, never, though, would I have guessed that these collection of books would have brought me here to a part of the country I've never been to before um, to spend time with all of you. Um, I was first introduced to the New England Dancing Masters during my student teaching in 2012. Um, at that time, I was exploring a philosophy of music education called or short, which uh, Peter just mentioned. Um, and I had a mentor teacher, uh, Josh Southern, um, who really showed me the ropes in that um, philosophy of education. Um, Orff, for those of you who don't know, it's named after Karl Orff, the German composer. And it's an approach that combines singing and speaking, storytelling, uh, playing of instruments, dance, creative movement, and play to give kids this well-rounded experience in music class. Uh, and the goal of it is to build lifelong lovers of music. Um, now this is wildly different than the music class that I went to when I was a kid. Uh, I don't know what music class has always been like around here. Apparently it's been pretty awesome for the last 30 years. <laughs> but when I grew up, uh, music class, you know, it, it was a, a class that had three things in it. It had uh, desks, it had textbooks, and it had one instrument, a piano, that none of the kids were allowed to play. <laughs> Only the teacher was allowed to play the piano. Um, the Orb classroom, on the other hand, uh, my first experience in that, I, I found out that it's full of instruments. So xylophones, metallophones, lock and shields, drums, ukuleles, recorders. And instead of having desks, um, it has just open space for, for dance and for play. Um, so I had 16 weeks in my student teaching, and uh, during that time, I got to learn from one of the best ORF teachers in the country, uh, Josh, and he is now the president of the ORF Short Association. Uh, and one of the many things that he taught me was that kids can almost always do more than adults think they can and give them credit for. Kids are fully capable of making serious music. Uh, and it's the teacher's role to put them in the right environment to succeed. And one of the ways that Josh did this was through traditional dance. And the dances that the kids loved most always came from these gray books with the New England Dance and Masters names on them. So um, that student teaching placement was 12 years ago. It was my first introduction to dances like Alabama Gal and Sasha, Kings and Queens Dance, Intersection Reel, Haste for the Wedding. I did all of those in my first placement. Um, and like the tagline in one of their collections says, these are never fail dances. And our students love doing them again and again. The dances were easy to understand, quick to teach, repeatable, and they left every student feeling successful. I was also struck by how beautiful the music was, and this is what made it different from everything else, is the quality of the recordings. I mean, one of the things, the quality of the recordings, it was the kind of music that I just enjoyed listening to on my own. Um, and when you're a music teacher, and I had five grades, and I'd see a different class every day, some of these dances you're playing over and over and over and over again, and what you don't want to do is use music that you don't want to listen to over and over. <laughs> So after I graduated, had my student teaching placement, I graduated, I found, I found my own job, uh, and I continued using the Dance Masters material 
and Nader dance is a regular part of my school sculpture. Um, didn't always know what I was doing, but the books were clear enough, simple enough instructions, that I was able to gradually add more and more new dances to my library. My kids were loving it, and even though we were never perfect, I decided to start posting videos to my YouTube channel, Bowtie Music. <laughs> The hope was to create a place where teachers, in search of new ideas and lessons, could go um, to find something inspiring. And eventually, those videos did. They started to spread. Um, but believe it or not, last night's village session dance, which I got to go to, was one of my first ever community folk dances I've ever attended. Um, back, I did realize that back in 2018, I did get to hear the Amadons present um, at one of the American Orf. Shore Association's um, professional development conferences. Uh, and as I signed up for individual workshops at the event, I was told by my colleagues that I had to make it to the Amazon's workshop. Um, it seemed to be the highest attended, uh, most coveted session of the entire conference. And when I arrived, I realized that the two of them were absolute rock stars. <laughs> in a massive ballroom filled with hundreds of music teachers from all over the country. These two kept everyone engaged and smiling, and I started to understand why these people and their colleagues were such legends. So, for whatever reason, when COVID hit, uh, my YouTube channel exploded, and the New England Dancing Masters videos racked up over 12 million views from all around the world. <laughs> And so now there's this audience. We have 25,000 subscribers um, to the channel. And next month I'm getting ready to uh, publish our website, um, which I hope will further extend the reach of these great resources. So as time went on, uh, these videos were out there. I got to gradually interact just a little bit uh, with the Dancing Masters through comments. Um, and, but yesterday was the first time I got to meet you all in person. <laughs> and so it is so good to, to meet you and to be hosted by you and uh, to experience this wonderful culture in this very special place. Um, it was clear after meeting them that these new friends are very legit, as legit as it gets. <laughs> I'm so impressed by their commitment to what they do and their friendship with one another. For the last 40 years, they've been living the dream, having fun making music and sharing it with others. And that's what I believe to be the goal of music education. And it's what I strive to share with my kids every day. So I wish everyone had the kinds of friends that these four have with each other today. I wish everyone believed in their work as much as these four believe in their work. Um, what a blessing your work has been to countless people, and what a legacy that you're leaving. So I've had a blast capturing um, your joy and sharing it with the world. I look forward to doing that more in the future, and I want to wish you a very hearty congratulations on your work. But uh, if it was bad weather, if it was raining or snowing, which is, uh, or snow outside in the wintertime, which is about half the time, we, we couldn't have phys ed outside, so we always did the same thing. She always did the same thing in that situation. We'd 
stay in the room and push the desk to the sides of the room and we choose partners and make square sets. And Mrs. Shaw taught and called square dances from her own piano playing to her own piano playing, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. By the time we were in sixth grade, we were all sophisticated dancers. Our favorite figure was the bus step swing. And there was no issue about whether anybody liked the dance. It's like, do you like to eat? Do you like to talk? No, it's like, blah, blah. You know, it's just, it was just part of our culture. We all loved the dance, and we all did it well. When I was just out of college and living in Cambridge, I met a woman named Annie O'Brien, who played a concertina for the, what was the name of that Cambridge women's team? The, Muddy River Morris team, and I met her in a therapy group. Enough about that, but um, <laughs> she introduced me. <laughs> but she introduced me to, um, I was doing early music then, and I was a cellist and a viola bombist, and I wasn't a singer at all, and she introduced me to Irish tune sessions, to contra dancing, to these group singing sessions where we just all sang around and sang folk songs without any papers. She introduced me to the music of John Roberts and Tony Varand, and she introduced me to uh, the CDSS Pinewoods Folk Music Week. And I was a born-again <coughs> folk musician. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the first contra dance I went to without Annie O'Brien, I met Mary Alice. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, <laughs> that's a great story that I'm not going to tell right now. But uh, anyway, the, uh, a few years later, uh, we, uh, we got married. Uh, we moved to Brattleboro and got married. And I found myself in a position of, uh, of, of teaching as a music teacher without having had any music education courses and without having ever had any experience as a music teacher. So I turned to what I knew best, which was singing and dancing. And I used, I taught my K-6 students dances I learned from Bob Dalsner at, uh, at Pinewood's at CDSS Family Week. And I learned to taught them dances I learned from W. Laufman's uh, publications and dances I gleaned from the CDSS community dance manuals, a lot of which I adapted for kids. Uh, and of course, as has been mentioned before, we were all music teachers at the same time, Andy, Mary Kay, and Mary Alice and I, and at the same, and, and we'd get together and we were developing quite a wonderful repertoire of dances that we shared. And I also was doing residencies then, and I always felt bad residencies of dance and storytelling and singing in other schools in Vermont. And um, I always felt bad when I left the residency because the kids couldn't dance when I left because I called to my own accordion playing, and so when I left, there was no music. So I said to Andy and Mary Kay, why don't we make a cassette tape with some of these dance tunes, and um, and then one of them, and, and so I can leave it behind in my residencies. And we said, yeah, we'll take a book too. And so we we did, and we called it after the classic dance by Dudley Altman, Chimes of Dunkirk. And um, that was, that was uh, I know there's a slightly different version of the story, it's like, a, but, but that's, um, that's my memory of that. And then later on, Mary Alice and I published our first collection of, uh, of singing games, which was called Jump Jim Joe, which later we changed to Rise Sally Rise, another story that we can do an entire workshop on <laughs> sometime, but not today. Mary Alice and I eventually found ourselves meeting um, day-long workshops for elementary school music, music teachers on how to teach traditional dance, song, and storytelling to children. And one of the gifts we got from these workshops, one of the gifts I particularly got was, was learning how to express in language some of the, what, the essence of why do you do traditional dance with children. And, and so here you are, you're a bunch of um, uh, music teachers, not a lot of experience in dance, but a lot of teachers, a lot of experience in music and in teaching music. And so here's something I might say one of these workshops. You just we just danced, done a nice. We've just done the um, uh, the uh, what's this, the uh, what's that one? The blade and races. That's a really great one to start with. We've gotten to start with the blade and races and a few others. And we sit down and I'd say to them, one of the reasons I'm a lifelong dancer is one of the reasons that I'm a lifelong dancer is that I had a positive experience dancing when I was a child. So my main goal when I am teaching dance is for the children to have a positive experience 
for them to have a good time. So, I have learned to trick them out of their self-consciousness. I challenge them, and this, I challenge them, and at the same time, I, I help them become successful. And and um, but the deepest, the deepest lesson I teach them is that I, when I am dancing with them, enjoy myself, and they just pick that up. It's infectious, and so I dance with them. I use music that I love. I do dances that I'm excited about. I've always known that part of the joy of dancing comes from beautiful group choreography, such as in Lucky Seven. Lucky Seven, as a lot of you know, it's a, uh, it's a circle mixer with a grand right and left in it. It ends with a grand right and left, I'm sorry, it ends with a promenade, uh, promenade into a circle left. And it can be a challenging part of the dance, but I really work that with the kids. So what happens, you're promenading, and then you need to let go of your, of your partner. The inside partner needs to step back, and then you all take hands, and then you take the first step. And I hope this works. So here we are, promenading. And you step back. It's the moment. That's the moment. That's that choreographical moment. And when all the children do that at the same time, I weep. It's just <laughs> fantastic. And you know what? The kids get it too. Just as Will said, the kids get it. They get good choreography. And when they do good choreography, they are happier and more joyful. I've always known that uh, that the part of the joy that comes from dancing comes from, from, from uh, that adults and children both have a deeper and more joyful experience when they uh, have good choreography. That's the end of the quote. You can not be music teachers anymore. <laughs> I am grateful. I am so grateful for the privilege of having a, uh, a bachelor's in music from college, but my deepest education my deepest education is the work I did in getting my advanced degree. This is a degree that many of you have. What could be better than year after year of a weekly intensive at CDSS Family Week with some of the best callers and dance leaders and, and, and singers and dance musicians that there are? I think that I'm going to call this uh, degree, this advanced degree, let's call it an AB from CDSS. That's what I'm aiming for. It. And a lot of us have it, and it just doesn't get better than that. It's very deep. And, it's, uh, and, I'm, and I'm also indebted to Poor Parlay. Everybody say, Poor Parlay. Poor Parlay, the annual national conference on teaching dance to children that Santa Longman started in 1997. I come out of each of those, just a bunch of people, all these people who come dance with children, and we all talk about it, and we teach each other dances, and what we learn is not so much the dances that we teach, but what I learn from there is why I teach dance, and because of that, after every Port Parlay conference, I just find, wow, I'm a better dance teacher because I understand more deeply why we teach dance. And also, another great thing about Port Parlay is that's where we met Eric Marin. So that was wonderful. <clears throat> this event kind of feels like getting an honorary degree. It also kind of feels like getting married. I mean, I just know all of you. So <laughs> But the honor is all mine, it's all ours. I am forever indebted, indebted to Mary Alice and Andy and Mary and Mary Kay for being such extraordinary, extraordinary and gifted colleagues for these 40 years. And I am sure I can safely speak for all four of us that we are all deeply indebted to the country dance and song society and all of its incarnations for fostering the rich world of traditional dance that we so
Saints and Song Society is an organization that has been around for over a hundred years. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> Haven't run it into the ground yet. Um, no, it's amazing to be to work at an organization with that sort of history um, and and to work with incredible colleagues that you, that are talented and that you trust. Because then, when you're the executive director. You can sit around and think about things that happened 50 years ago. And you can go into the storeroom and you can read the notes of, about the things that happened 50 years ago. It's, um, it is a beautiful privilege um, to be at the head of this organization. So I do think about 50 years ago a lot, and that was 1973, for those of you who need a minute. Um, and I think a lot about 50 years from now. And I think about what it means to be in the center of those two points in time and the responsibility that not just we have as a staff, but the whole community has. Because we're not just talking about preserving history. We're talking about breathing life into living traditions. And that's something that we all carry responsibility for and we all take very seriously. And sometimes there are people that come along that create beautiful, wonderful, useful gifts and they give it to the rest of us so that all of us can keep breathing life into these living traditions. I want to say thank you personally to all four of you. Um, in 1996 was uh, the first time I went to Pinewoods and um, I bought Chimes of Dunkirk in the bookstore. And I, my life changed. I started teaching kids wherever I could, whenever I could, using that book and then the next book and then the next book. It is incredible to think about how many of us out there were inspired by those thin little books. They're just exactly what we need. And they're what the world needs now more than anything. We live in this time of technological isolation where everybody is forgetting how to be human and be real with each other. And I know in, up here in like folk dance heaven, sometimes you forget about it. But you know, out in the out in the rest of the country, there are people who don't even know that they need this. And because of your books and the work that you've done, there are teachers out there who are now able to share that. I really want to talk to you too. <laughs> I, um, I represent the non-teacher side of things. Um, I, I worked at folk dance camps and weekends and, and weddings. Gosh, I love using your materials at weddings. It's just the best. Um, but any time any of us use those materials, you see people come to life. You see them relax. You see them reach towards each other and depend on each other and interact with each other in a way that you can just tell some of them have never experienced before. So the Country Dance and Song Society is, I'm getting all closer. I am honored to be presenting this award on behalf of the CDSS membership, which nominated, the CDSS membership nominates awardees the board chooses them, and then I get to come to the party. Um, but it is my honor and privilege to, to give this award to you all today because you've changed my life for the better. You've changed so many of the, people, the lives of so many people in this room. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people you, you'll never meet. But you did it, and it's incredible. And we all love you so much. So. Thank you. If you four would come up here, I'll give you your award.
It's only one tile per household. I'm sorry. <laughs>